Hi, good morning, and welcome to the um, Zimmer and Peacock um, Introduction to Wearable Biosensors and um, Transdermal Biosensors. So um, I'm just watching it um, on um, YouTube at the moment, so I, so I can see that we've gone live. So um, what I'll do is the first slide I'm going to do is just a, um, a quick agenda. So I suppose, first of all, thank you for um, joining our um, live streaming webinar this morning. Um, you can see that there's, well, in a bit, you'll see that we've actually got, we're going to do a live demo um, about um, halfway through the slides this morning. I'm going to try and finish on time because I know that, and in fact, I'll stop, start a stopwatch because I know that some of you have meetings um, immediately after this. So I appreciate your time this morning. Um, just some quick news. Um, every week, Zimmer and Peacock does actually do a, a webinar. We do it mainly for our, or we do it for our uh, members. Um, and so we have something called the ZP, ZP Developer Zone. I also just want to say that we have quite a few vacancies at Zimmer and Peacock. We've um, grown rapidly over the last six years. Um, so just last week, I think we put out that we have a fully funded PhD available in Norway, um, and working on basically putting biosensors into fish. We are also looking for um, server-side engineers. So obviously, all these wearable sensors and biosensors are, are no good unless we can actually go and put the data somewhere and store the data. Um, and um, we are also opening a lab in London. Um, as beautiful as it is to have labs in Wolverhampton in Horton, I think there's quite a few people in the world who actually quite like to live and work in London. So we do uh, we do um, accept that, and that's why we're opening um, a lab up in London. So now we'll get on with the main um, webinar itself. OK. So I'm just going to do a quick discussion about what we are going to talk about today. We are going to talk about wearable biosensors. Um, and we'll be talking more about the chemical and biological parameters that one can measure with biosensors, and talking less about um, electrical signals like um, ECG, um, or um, pulse oximetry. Um, so we'll be talking more about chemical and biological signals and less about um, sort of conditional monitoring like temperature and things like that. Um, we'll be talking about the commercial landscape. And unfortunately, whenever you um, talk about wearable biosensors, you always have to mention the words or the acronym CGM, Continuous Glucose Monitoring. And I'm sorry, because if you watch videos by Zimmer and Peacock or you know about Zimmer and Peacock, you'll know that we're possibly the world's leading independent developer um, of CGM um, sensors uh, and manufacturers. We're also going to talk about where to place sensors. Do you place them near the skin, i.e. through clothing? Do you place them on the skin, where you can measure things in the sweat? Do you place them through the skin, that's transdermal? Or you can actually place them um, under the skin as well. So what we are not going to talk so much about today is we're not going to talk about so much about smartwatches, um, which are really good for, uh, well, you know, the, so there's a lot of smartwatches. I mean, I'm wearing a, you know, it's not a plug for Apple. I don't work for Apple, but we, we're wearing an Apple smartwatch. Um, oh, I'm, I am. So I'm not going to be talking about so much about smartwatches. I did see a, a press release last night that the Apple smartwatch has also just become an oximeter, so they can now measure. There's a couple of LEDs on the back of the smartwatch, and I suspect that they can use that to measure the amount of um, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much about those because they're not, in my definition, true chemical and biological sensors. Um, there's also... Um, I'm not going to talk too much about ECG, electrocardiograms. These are really picking up electrical signals from the heart. And I'm not going to talk too much about uh, heart rate monitors because, again, they don't, they're don't. they vital sign monitoring, um, but they're not really um, chemical and biological. They're not measuring chemical and biological analytes. I'm sorry I'm talking rather fast, but I realize we've got so much to get through. Such a big subject, wearable biosensors. And um, we've also got the demo, um, so I don't want to sort of take up all the time um, just chatting away. Um, so the definition of a wearable biosensor for us is something that's measuring something um, chemical or biological. And so by that, I mean, we mean glucose and chloride, lactate and cortisol. 
it's probably also just worth mentioning that um, after this webinar, and um, this will also be on YouTube as well. Um, so, you know, if, if a colleague misses this or you, you have to go early, don't worry about it. Um, we will um, put this up onto YouTube later on. So, yeah, biological, chemical, biosensors to us means we're interested in measuring things like glucose, chloride, lactate, cortisol, and there's um, quite a long list of this. I, I'm just watching the YouTube feed and I recognize many of the names, so Maria and Roberto and Lucio. So nice to see you guys. Um, so the three questions when thinking about um, biosensors and wearable biosensors, what are you going to measure? And I think the more exciting one is how are you going to wear it? Um, and really the, maybe the most important one is why are we doing this? Um, you know, so measure, you know, what can we measure? Well, we can measure in the sweat things like um, ions, so, you know, sodium, potassium, chloride, you know, these things are um, very um, doable, uh, pH. Uh, we can measure molecules like, you know, well, like lactate, um, whether there's a clinical use for measuring, for example, glucose in the sweat, I'm not so sure about that. But the question is, what are we going to measure? And ions and small molecules um, are quite um, doable. How are we going to wear it? I think that's a really interesting um, commercial question, you know, because th if these sensors are going to be worn, then they're going to have to be comfortable. Um, and I think, you know, some of the slides I show that you know, integrating them into devices we're already wearing, you know, for example, my glasses, um, you know, that seems like a clever way of making a wearable biosensor. I just saw Shirley join us in from India as well. Cool. Um, and really, the question is, why are we going to do this? And that's really a business question. Uh, you definitely shouldn't be going into the lab and you shouldn't definitely not be turning those instruments on unless you have a sense of why are we doing this. Um, so there's a really important question about, you know, what's the business model for actually doing this wearable biosensors? At Zimmer Pivot, we do like wearables and we like them because wearables really kind of fit um, sort of three categories. You can use wearables for measuring health. So continually measuring glucose in people um, is really beneficial to type one diabetics. Um, and type two diabetics are also starting to adopt um, CGM sensors. So yeah, you can measure, you can have a wearable for health and the glucose sensor is the classic example of that. You can have a wearable for measuring performance. So um, before COVID-19, I would say one of the big growth areas in wearable sensors or in sensors in general was wearable lactate sensors. So everyone, not everyone, but we had a lot of inquiries about making wearable um, lactate sensors. Um, and you can also have wearable sensors for wellness. So wellness and performance, you know, all of these overlap a bit, but wellness, I put things like cortisol, you know, maybe measuring stress. And hydration fits under wellness, and it also fits under under lactate as well. So there's three, you know, that you can purely have wearables just for your health. You could be having a wearable just for wellness, or you could be having a wearable for performance. And I think measuring the lactate in athletes is the classic for performance. Um, so we are talking about on, on body um, analytical chemistry, and I've got a big wrong. Um, symbol here or wrong statement here i got this from a paper and it said in this paper that if you're going to be wear making a wearable biosensor it's really important to be able to match um the um, the laboratory results and I, I and i would say if that's the case then and if that's your criteria for success that you're going to be able, you're going to be as good as the laboratory i think it's a really good idea to just stop because the laboratories i mean these are you know, controlled environments with very trained people, they're air conditioned, the humidity is sometimes controlled, you know, people are measuring volumes very accurately, everything is done really precisely, there's no dirt or mess getting into the samples, everyone's, you know, people are wearing lab coats, there's not electrical noise in the laboratory, so setting the bar, hi Maria, so setting the bar really high and saying that you're going to be as good as the lab, um, is is just really not achievable and I, i'd also say it's achievable but with time you have to get something onto the market and you have to stay on the market for some time and while you're on the market 
you can do a generation two product and then a generation three product, and maybe you'll get as good as the laboratory. I mean, the first wearable glucose sensors were not as good as the lab. And even today, um, let's use this, let's use the um, glucose strip, for example. So glucose strips sold in the billions, they're used every day by type one or type two diabetics. The technology is 40 years old. It's still not as good as the laboratory. So do not expect to make a wearable biosensor and have the bar set that you're going to be as good as the laboratory. I can see Raul from India has joined us as well. So nice to see you, Raul. Um, now, the only non-invasive um, sensors that are sort of currently used, I think, well, not, not only, but the two non-invasive tests currently used for measuring people's wellness, or sorry, health, um, there's a test for cystic fibrosis and the diabetes one. And I'll just sort of touch on them um, very quickly. So just as a, for interest, um, cystic fibrosis, for example, is measured through the sweat. And I'm definitely not suggesting that everyone runs out and starts making a chloride sensor for the sweat for cystic fibrosis. The reason being is um, it is a very niche disease. I think, you know, there is a lot of testing um, early on to pick up these people. Um, and so, you know, the, the testing that's in place is fairly good. The continuous monitoring of chloride is not really going to improve the outcomes for these people. And if you do want to measure um, the chloride in sweat as a diagnostic, it can just really be done as a single, single point test, get the results. And unfortunately, that person can be diagnosed with um, cystic fibrosis. And it can also be followed up then with the genetic test. And just out of interest, um, before there were a nice laboratory test for chloride, you could literally taste the skin and that would be an indication of whether somebody had um, cystic fibrosis or not. The big wearable biosensor at the moment is CGM, continuous glucose monitoring. This is a classic on the right-hand picture here where the guy's got a patch on his arm um, and he has sort of telemetry going to a screen so that he can see how his glucose is tracking up and down. Um, so in terms of um, the wearables roadmap, things that are um, that are fairly easy. When, if you're talking about small molecules, then redox is an interesting one. If you're interested in measuring the, the, the stress in people, um, everyone talks about cortisol. I would actually go and suggest you look at something called redox, um, reductive oxidation. Whether you're um, stressed or non-stressed, whether you're high in um, antioxidants or low in antioxidants, this can be really be measured through redox. Um, and it's much easier than trying to measure cortisol which is what everyone actually focuses in on. So redox and oxygen, these are pretty um, doable. Glucose is um, very doable in terms of wearables. Um, lactate and alcohol, the, the enzymes are just a little bit wimpier, um, not so robust, so it makes them a little bit tougher to do. Ketones is tougher because um, many small molecules have an oxidase enzyme, and if the small molecule has an oxidase enzyme, that makes it easier to make a wearable sensor for it. Ketones don't have an oxid oxidase um, enzyme. Um, so ketones is tougher and cortisol is tougher again. And cortisol because it's often done through a sort of antibody antigen interaction. So those kind of assays are really quite tough. Um, ions are actually one of the easiest things to do. So if somebody was came to me and said, I want to make a wearable sensor, you know, what's the easiest thing I could do? I might suggest to them something like pH um, and then things like sodium and potassium. The reason pH doesn't require any expensive molecules, any delicate molecules, it's quite straightforward to do. The, all the formulation is um, inorganic. Sodium, potassium require, and calcium require what's called ionophores. These can be quite expensive molecules. Um, and um, they can be a little, they're not so robust. And then the other thing that I think is quite doable is actually hydration. Um, the, the, now, what you're measuring is the osmolarity in, um, in the sweat, and that's meant to be linked to hydration. Um, now, if any of this, if you want to know about the science behind these types of sensors, then we've done a few um, webinars in the past. Um, you'll see Andre in a bit. Andre is, um, Andre is very well known in the world of biosensing. Um, and you'll see him demonstrating some glucose sensors in other videos. So 
If you want to know about the science of these things, then have a look at our video on impedance spectroscopy and also have a look at our video on electrochemical um, biosensors. Right, so I did say that, you know, this, this one is all about um, biosensing. Um, and I did say that we were going to look at the commercial landscape and the commercial landscape in wearable biosensors. I'm sorry, it is dominated by continuous glucose monitoring, CGM. So let's just take a quick look at CGM. And I know I'm talking fast. And as I say, it's just we've got a fair amount of material to get through. Some people have a hard stop on the hour. And um, so I want to make sure that we're kind of done that. So CGM is the dominant technology in this wearable space. Um, in this example, I've got a cartoon where you can kind of see that there's, there's a sensor basically sticking or it's transdermal. It's gone through the skin. It's sitting in the interstitial fluid. Um, and it's measuring the glucose in the interstitial fluid. So that's what a CGM sensor is. This particular one is, um, is an electrochemical CGM. The nice thing about measuring, making glucose sensors is you can make glucose sensors on I, just about any insulating surface. So you can make a glucose sensor on paper, on ceramic, on PCBs, um, on polymers. Um, even on fabrics. Now, my only comment about fabrics is um, you're going to enjoy. You know, it, you, you can actually get you can actually get glucose oxidase down onto the fabric. You could even make it work. Um, the only thing is, just watch out for the wash cycle, because I suspect the first time that the um, the biosensor on a fabric went through the wash, um, it's going to um, destroy the sensor. So, you know, even though we can do glucose sensing on, for example, clothing. My biggest concern would be the um, the first time the clothing got washed. It's not really going to survive that. And yeah, you can also make glucose sensors on paper, um, electrochemical glucose sensors as well. Um, you can detect glucose obviously in the blood. That's happened for 40 years. You can measure it in what's called the interstitial fluid. That's that fluid that's just below the surface of the skin. And you can do it using needles, oh, it's called a wire sensor. And I'll describe a wire sensor to you in a bit. Um, I know that there's some people um, online with this video who are interested in micro needles. So you can also measure um, glucose in the interstitial fluid using micro needles. You can also do it, the holy grail of um, measuring glucose, maybe in wearables is non-invasively. And um, so there's been a, this is a company that's that's no longer around. They try to do it through um, Raman spectroscopy. So everyone's got this dream that they're able to shine some sort of light um, through the skin and detect the glucose um, that way. So a lot, a lot of people have tried it. So C8 have tried this non-invasive way. Um, Apple have tried it the non-invasive way. Um, there's currently a company, I think, called Mavano, who's trying to do it through radio frequency. Um, it would be great if these techniques were working, but so far nobody's managed to pull it off. And if you're interested in making a non-invasive wearable glucose sensor, um, look up this URL, um, nivglucose.com. It's there's an interesting article. The guy updates this article um, every three years, and he does. Um, it's got the title "Hunting the Deceitful Turkey," so it's worth having a look at that article. It's fairly well known. Among, among us who are interested in um, glucose monitoring. Just to touch very briefly on um, the wire sensor, if you want to know a lot about glucose wire sensors, then I would look at, um, Z, there's, we've got a product called CGM sensors, CGM wire sensor, take a look at that URL. The nice thing about this kind of technology is there's nothing new here. Um, the picture that's slightly hidden by my face um, is a guy called um, George Wilson. And he, this paper, well, the paper that I have referenced up here, Broke Progress Towards Development of Implantable Sensors, uh, um, he published this paper in 1992. So that was before I went to university. So it shows really that there's, you know, there's nothing new here. Now we do a version of his um, sensor. So we have a sort of platinum wire sensor um, with glucose oxidase on it. And we also have silver, silver chloride reference. I just saw a quick question come up on the YouTube stream. It says, is it possible to monitor glucose and deliver insulin simultaneously in the same patch? Correct. Right. So the quick answer is, it is possible to measure glucose and insulin in the same patch. Um, just watch out for one thing. 
insulin is often um, is often packed, or there's there's phenols that they use to as a preservative in the insulin material. So you've got to you've got to make sure that the insulin that you're delivering doesn't contain electrochemically active molecules, and phenols, um, I believe, are in there, and they might be electrochemically active. So the answer the question is, can I both deliver insulin from a what's called a patch pump and measure the glucose at the same time so they have a feedback loop the concept is called the artificial pancreas um and the answer is you can do it you just have to really think about the sensor and make sure that the sensor is not detecting other materials that are electrochemically active in the insulin solution and um i probably i probably i have thought about this and i probably have some of the answers to that question um now, one of the grandfathers of a wearable um, continuous glucose uh, meter, some of you guys um, who've been doing this as long as I have will remember the um, glucose watch. It was a business um, in part led by a guy called Russ Potts. And in that, he was using a technique called ion iontophoresis, where he's effect effectively applying voltage and drawing the um, the interstitial fluid through the skin and then measuring it externally. Um, it was a nice concept. Um, they did get it on the market, but they didn't stay on the market. But that would be the kind of grandfather of probably wearables, in, or a lot of wearables. Definitely one of the grandfathers of wearable biosensors and actually the grandfathers of continuous glucose monitoring. Um, here's some honorable mentions of people who have tried to make um, wearable continuous glucose monitoring. Echo Therapeutics had a really good um, effort at it. Echo, they were actually abrading the skin. So they were literally trying to rub a little bit of skin off the surface um, and let the interstitial fluid then come through that way. Um, I mentioned C8 earlier on, who were trying to do realm spectroscopy. I mentioned Apple earlier on, who were actually trying to do, um, they're basically trying to use infrared signals. And I suspect it's because um, on the um, Apple Watch, there's plenty of um, LEDs here, um, and they can use those LEDs. And just breaking news, um, I saw that Apple last night did a press release where they're now able to measure um, oxygen levels using the Apple Watch. So I suspect basically they're using the LEDs to measure the percentage of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Um, so um, now... Everyone thinks that Google invented this, um, or you know, this wearable contact lens um, for measuring glucose in, in basically in the eye. I, I think that technology was old by the time Google had picked it up. Um, so Google have also had a go at you know wearable biosensors, um, and there's a company here called Glysense who are making a much more invasive um, type continuous glucose sensor, um, and they are still operating. Sensionics is definitely worth a mention in this market. Then most of the sensing, most of the biosensing I like to talk about is electrochemical. Um, a, because I'm an electrochemist, and B, because it works. And probably C, because actually, if you want to make a low-cost sensor, electrochemistry is, is, is a good science for it. But sensionics are, are, aren't doing um, electrochemistry, so I have to mention that. Um, their CEO, Tim Goodenauer, um, actually was one of the... Um, there's a technology owned by Abbott, um, and Tim Goodenauer sort of ran that business for several years, so he has a background in this kind of science. But anyway, their technology is a long-term implantable, um, but it's, um, it's, it's basically using LEDs um, to detect the glucose there. Right, I am going fast. Um, so the big three in continuous glucose monitoring are Abbott, Medtronic, and Dexcom, for many of you. Um, Yeah, so as Roberto Orbitz is just saying as well online that yeah, that's that 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 contact lens that Google picked up. Yeah, it's much older than it was a long around a long time before Google picked it up. But anyway, the big three currently on the market in CGM are Abbott, Medtronic, and Dexcom. So Shirley asked a question online earlier on about whether we could um, measure glucose and deliver insulin in the same patch, and that's quite nice because Medtronic have that type of system they don't have it in the same patch they basically um, on the torso here um, they're measuring the glucose using a cgm sensor and then they have a pump 
delivering insulin. And when those two things are, when the sensor controls the insulin, then that's called closed loop and, that, and that's called um, the artificial pancreas. That's the term for it. Abbott, at least in Europe, um, everyone perceives them as being, you know, one of the best, better um, glucose sensors on the market. Um, and then we also have Dexcom on the market as well, who are also um, significant players. Now, these three sensors all have um, three things in common. They're all transdermal, and they're all electrochemical, and they're all wire-like. So when I say wire-like, I mean, you know, they have kind of electrons that sit on the side of the, outside of the skin. Um, um, then there's the, the sensor itself is punched through the skin. Um, they're measuring the glucose in the interstitial fluid. Now, Medtronic is what they call a generation one glucose sensor. If you're not sure what a generation one glucose sensor is, um, I'll touch upon it briefly. But yeah, it's a generation one um, glucose sensor. Dexcom is a generation one. Abbott relies on um, a series of papers um, and patents by a guy called Adam Heller. Um, he was at the University of Texas. Um, and um, that's actually a generation two sensor. And there are lots of companies who are quite interested in making what's called a generation three sensor. So a generation three sensor uses an enzyme which doesn't have a mediator. So in uh, a generation one glucose sensor has oxygen as its mediator. So oxygen is interacting with the glucose. In a generation two glucose sensor, you have a mediator. It's a, another molecule that's able to shuttle electrons from the glucose. I don't know why I put lactone there, but from from the glucose to the enzyme, from the enzyme to the electrodes, you have a mediator. In a generation three sensor, the enzyme doesn't require a mediator. It's transferring um, electrons directly to the electrodes. Um, and I'm going to try and get through CGM quickly now because the directions for CGM, everyone would love to do non-invasive. And I've mentioned C8, Apple, and Google. So you can kind of see the kind of billions that have really been thrown at trying to do non-invasive um, glucose measurements. Um, I think in reality, minimally invasive is really where this is going. And minimally invasive to me means microneedles. Um, so you've, um, minimally invasive, we've had GlucoWatch have a go at this, Echo Therapeutics have had a go at this. Sano Health, they're a little hard to find these days because um, I think they're in hibernation at the moment, but Sano Health have tried microneedles and BioLink they're the easiest guys to find online who are doing uh, micro needles. Um, yeah, so I'm just checking a few slides ahead. Um, it's probably just worth saying that the reason we can talk with some confidence on micro needles, or sorry, on um, glucose and biosensors is because at Zimmer and Peacock, we do have a lot of on the shelf um, biosensors and biosensor formulations. You know, we're measuring everything from um, oxygen to garlic, um, from nitrate to Chile, so we have quite a depth of experience. We also have quite a depth of experience in terms of, um, we sell micro needles on the website, and we also have the electronics on the website as well. And we also have um, a, um, a sensor and a sweat patch configuration as well. Um, we do think that, you know, nobody likes to give blood. Nobody likes to actually, people don't really like having their skin broken in order to get at the interstitial fluid. So it would be lovely if we were able to measure things in sweat. So we do um, have pre-existing on the shelf um, technology for measuring things like the sweat. Um, I just want to make a quick comment as well about the electronics. So as EP, we do have the electronics. I want to just make a couple of honorary mentions. Um, there's a chipset from Texas Instruments. Um, I want to say the MSP430. It's a classic chipset. It's used in a lot of glucose meters. So we are familiar with that, that. but all but these days um, analog devices have also done a really nice um, chip-sized potential stat. So if anyone's thinking about developing electronics for um, wearable biosensors, then um, I would check out some of the links on our website, especially this GFET, because there we do reference the chip that we use um, in one of our devices, and that's my recommendation for um, a small size potential set. Right, so now we're going to go to a demo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing for a second. I'm going to mute myself. And Andre and Mots, you'll suddenly see their faces appear. Um, and they're going to do a quick demonstration for you guys. So I'm going to mute. 
Yeah. Uh, can you hear us now? Just a sound check. I can hear you fine. Yeah. yeah that's excellent. All right. Perfect. Okay. Uh, welcome to the live demo. So at this moment, we are going to present a small, uh, uh, before we, we show the, the potential of using it as a wearable, uh, we are going to show you uh, a small bench top on, um, on one of the, so this is a, a flexible uh, circuit in PT film printed. Uh, so on, on here, we have to, in order for it to work, we need a battery and we have like a flexible battery as well. So you can see that you can even bend the battery if you need it. Uh, so it's, um, it's pretty flexible. And, uh, and uh, we need, of course, in this case, we are using as an example, a glucose, uh, a glucose sensor. So, um, so the objective of this glucose sensor is just to show you a signal. Uh, the signal, this is connected via Bluetooth. So it has a blue, uh, an antenna and it's connected, you have the, the board populated, and it's connected via Bluetooth to my computer. And so the objective here is for us to give small samples of, uh, of um, glucose, and then, uh, and then um, observe just a step response in this live demo. So, uh, so um, on this, this red bit that you see, it's just a it's just a, um, a connector adapter. It's just a 3D printed part adapter in order to hold the sensor in position. So um, so in this instance, I'm going to take two different calibration solutions, glucose calibration solutions. You can see on the background that it's it's already communicating. I have it running at a potential of 650 millivolts, um, and uh, I have a sample rate of five seconds. And um, and yeah, so uh, so I just want to. Um, this is not an excuse. It's just to let you know that it's it's kind of hard. I can't on this interface. So this is the readout platform. I can't. I don't have control at this moment over the scale. So it might be some sometimes hard to to observe. But um, that's just the way it is. So. Uh, I think Andre can read off the numeric value so you can see if there's a step change. Yeah. So at this moment, I just uh, I just added um, a small glucose concentration uh, onto the electrodes of the sensor. So you did see a step change. Uh, the sensor has become wet. So uh, I'm gonna we are going to wait uh, one minute and then we we change to to a different concentration. So um... so when I look at that data, I, I mean, I, I, I can see that it was going along in the baseline and now it's sort of stepped up to a new place. Yeah, so so it was it was dry. So what you see is a typical amperometric curve. So it went up and now it's going to stabilize uh, at, at a value. And uh, so once it stabilizes at this value, then it's, it's reading and then I can I can try to do a, a step change. So, um, so the problem is that the sensor first was completely dry, and then we wet it with solution. So, uh, so I'm just waiting a little bit, one minute, for the value to stabilize, and um, and then I will uh, I will change solution. So I will change I mean, solution. I, it's, 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 it's a bit of a plug from 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 us, but I mean it, it's worth saying. I mean those glucose sensors and even those test solutions and and that board and that battery. I mean they're all just off-the-shelf items for us, um, you know, so we have, it's not like Andre had to make these things for this demo. These were things that he just, we, we, you know, we have them on our web store. So, um, yeah. so I can, so I, and I agree with you, Andre, that if people are not sure why the data looks the way it does, this is what they call the kind of Cottrell response. So he had a dry sensor, he added the glucose, it spikes up and then it kind of comes down, it drifts down towards this plateau. Um, so yeah, sorry, Andre. No, that, that's correct. So, so in this in this instance, uh, we are using like a, an off-the-shelf sensor, glucose sensor, and uh, I just want to um, to mention as well. So we are doing a bench top, but everything here is flexible in a way, most parts except for the ceramic sensor. But we also do these sensors in PT films, and um, and uh, and. Uh, 
if if once you attach it to the body, so the objective is to the forearm or the back. So the objective is to with with um, you attach it to the body. Uh, it could be your forearm or it could be on the back on your back, for example, uh, or in your forehead. And you can use basically anything in order to uh, that feels comfortable. Just a small band. It can't even see the sensor. And uh, and so and so it's there in order to sample it properly. And Martin showed very well in his slides. So the sensor should have um, a microfluidic, a small microfluidic channel, and that will suck the solution for capillary forces into the sensor electrode area, which is the sensing part of the of our sensor. So I think we waited long enough. It's now stabilized, and what I'm going to do is with um, with the tech paper, I will I will I will dry the solution on the top of the sensor, and I will I will pipette um, a different solution uh, into it. So just bear with me for a second. I'll try to do this. So I'm now taking off the solution, and and I do appreciate the um, the camera work by by uh, Mots here doing a nice job changing the angle. So uh, You're welcome. <laughs> So now I in, have increased slightly the glucose concentration. Again, I can't. I can't. Um, it's just the way it I is. I, I, mean. I cannot. I cannot you, you change can, the scale. But yeah, there is. It's higher, yeah. Yeah, there was an increase of about five millimolar, so which is what we uh, have here, uh, uh, about five millimolar increase um, of of glucose concentration. So. Um, so uh, I hope this is more or less uh, helps visualizing the how it can be. Um, and uh, any questions about this demo or any any uh, special uh, observations or, or things that you would like to see in the next demo, please let me know. Uh, let Martin know, and we can try to include them on the next. Brilliant. All right. Well, thanks, Andre um, and Mots. I do appreciate that. So, um, so I'll just check the time now. So we're, we've got sort of 20 minutes left, but we'll try and finish up early. So, um, so what I'm going to do now is carry on with the uh, thank Mots and on Andre for the demo. Very nice. So they started with a dry sensor. They pipetted on some glucose solution. Um, it, it spiked and then it relaxed and then it came to a um, a new um, signal. So what we'll do now is, um, now we have talked a lot about glucose this morning. I sort of apologize for, for that. Um, Roberto Orbitz asked um, whether we need to um, calibrate each sense before use. The quick answer is we'd hope to do it in the factory because we can't expect real customers or real patients to be doing that. So no, so we're not expecting that. Now, what Zimmer Peacock is doing is we have a lot of standard products, and so we're really trying to help academics and entrepreneurs get to market quickly. So we have a lot of off-the-shelf technology, um, but these things still need to be put into the right form factors in order that they actually become medical products. So uh, other analytes that I want to mention this morning, I don't want it all to be dominated by glucose. Um, so people are focused on glucose. Um, other things that people are very interested in is lactate. Cortisol is, we get a lot of inquiries around cortisol. I think hydration is really interesting and quite doable. And, you know, maybe there's an interest growing in actually the continuous measurement of sodium and potassium, potentially for dialysis patients. I think at the moment dialysis patients are kind of called in, in a sort of routine fashion um, rather than sort of when they need the dialysis, they're just called in just on the schedule. So it'd be nice to be able to be a bit more um, accurate in calling in people for dialysis and potentially measuring the sodium potassium could be an interesting way of doing that. Um, some honorable mentions. Um, L'Oreal actually did a nice um, wearable biosensor. It wasn't electrochemical. It, it was colorimetric, but I did like it because it was wearable. 
it used some microfluidics and it was um, apparently measuring the pH of the skin, which makes really good business sense for a company like that. Um, and it also kind of went nicely because they, before that, they'd actually done a light sensor. So I do like, you know, the innovation coming from this company that, you know, they're obviously about skin care, you know, so the things that they think are important to skin is measuring the pH. So they did have a concept product out there about this. And they also think that light is important to, you know, as a, as a damaging factor on skin. So they also have a little light sensor for it. So that was kind of cool. Um, Hydration, there's a couple of companies out there playing or working on hydration. There was one company seems to have changed its name or been bought. They were called LVL, um, now BSX, doing um, a hydration sensor, and then another company do, called NIX. So it's not just all about glucose. Um, other people are out there um, working on things like hydration. Some mentions, um, I wasn't... I was going to keep away, and I am keeping away from things that are not really bio, not biosensors in my definition of the term, which is chemical and biological analytes. Um, um, but Philips, for example, have done this ECG wearable sensor. Um, and Empatica seem to be doing a, a, a sensor for helping with neurological research. This one I really quite like. Again, I, I, I am trying to keep it to chemical and biological um, biosensing, but I want to give these guys an honorable mention. They're called Athos. There's a technique out there called um, electromyography, which has been around for decades, where you effectively measure the electrical signals from, um, from muscles as the muscles are working. And Athos has basically taken that kind of technology and just implemented it um, into wearable clothing. Oh, sorry, into clothing, which is obviously by definition wearable. So I think Athos are making a really good job of this. And I mean, from their own website, you know, I can see that literally they started with sort of standard electromyography um, and they've just made the form factor much nicer. And Athos is a good example of, you know, taking something that's probably already done and quite robust in terms of electromyography but put it into a cool form factor, you know, wearable, you know, suits, the electrodes for measuring the um, the electrical signals from the muscles are probably buried in that suit or in that, yeah, in the clothing. So that's a nice example of a wearable sensor, even though it's not, a, strictly speaking, a wearable biosensor. Now, the academic literature, um, there's lots of people out there, I wouldn't say it was dominated, but one of the most... Um, highest outputs in this space is a guy called Joseph Wang. Um, so when you look through Joseph Wang's papers, he does have, um, he does talk about reverse iontophoresis. So it's worth knowing that, you know, even though Joseph Wang does academic papers on reverse iontophoresis, the glucose watch was out in about 2000, and that was definitely a reverse um, iontophoresis device. He does do papers on um, Microneedles, you know, and microneedles, there are quite a few um, groups around the world who are working on microneedles. Um, but Joseph Wang's papers are always worth a look at for, um, for inspiration or to see what's going on. Um, and, I mean, he, you know, he has lactate sensors in the sweat, which is really similar to some of the things that um, we have on the shelf as well. Um, I did like this particular, I mean, Joseph, on this particular um, slide does show some nice form factors for wearable biosensors. He has the sensor wrapped around the ear, um, but he also has the sensor kind of in the bridge of, of a pair of glasses. And that's kind of nice because, you know, it's easy to wear a pair of glasses, um, you know, and if the sensor is discreetly in the bridge there of, the, of those glasses in the nose bridge, that's pretty cool. I did like this concept where he put a sensor um, actually on the, um, on the glove. Um, I think it's a bit extreme to start putting your finger into things. To, but I could see, for example, you know, if somebody said to me, I want to make a pH sensor on the tip of a of, of a glove like that, yeah, I, I think it's actually quite doable. Whether you want to do it comes down to the business model and whether you need to do it. But um, it's a nice, it's a nice um, form factor. I just want to sort of spend one of the last five minutes, if you give me that, um, just to talk about um, smart textiles a little bit. So Joseph Wang, when he's making biosensors on clothing, um, this, for example, he's often using screen printing. So he's screen printing 
into the sweatbands of clothing. Smart textiles have been around for decades. I mean, Gore-Tex, that was a brand name, and it's still a brand name, but that Gore-Tex was, was known when I was a child. So smart fabrics and smart materials have been out for a long time. Osmotex is worth a mention in the smart fabrics um, world. They are using um, um, electro-osmotic force, I want to say. What they're doing is they basically apply a voltage between two conducting materials, and they're able to draw liquid through the material. So I think, I mean, Osmotex have been running for years, but they've really stepped up recently and started to get themselves into sportswear. I like it because it, in the end it has um, it has electrodes. I'm an electrochemist, so I like electrodes, and it has the application of voltage, and it's using the voltage to draw material or liquid out of um, the sportswear. So it's quite nice. You know, these back panels would, if an athlete was sweating, then they could basically draw the moisture out of the clothing. So I quite I like that um, technology. At the moment, when we think about smart textiles, you know, there's generation one text. Um, products where the smart wearable is not in the clothing itself. Um, Google has a technology um, called, I want to say J-Card, where they're basically just putting a dongle into a pocket in the clothing. So that's a kind of generation one, I would call it. Generation two is, um, is somebody more like Athos, where they have the sensors, in this case, they're just really electrodes um, in the clothing. And generation three is where the biosensor is really merged into the clothing. Now, I did say that Joseph Wang, in, or in most of his papers, is using screen printing. Um, I want to contrast it with a Canadian academic called um, Trish, Trisha Andrews. Um, and um, she actually uses embroidery to make conductive materials. So you can think that now there's potentially two ways of making electrodes and therefore biosensors on fabrics screen print it, which is Joseph Wang does a lot of, or embroidery, which Trisha uh, Andrews is doing. And there was quite a nice um, PhD that I read um, some while back where the guy had actually tried both techniques. And I think he had a really good point that actually, um, when you screen print, screen printing onto fabrics, um, I, I, you know, I've had screen printed t-shirts myself, you know, the, the, the screen printed can actually end up um, drying and peeling off and cracking. And it might not take too many wash cycles for that to happen, whereas embroidery, um, I believe, is actually a little bit more robust. And in this sort of PhD I was reading, you know, he actually contrasted electrodes made by embroidery and electrodes made by screen printing. And, yeah, the embroidery technique was um, more robust. So even though at Zimmer and Peacock, we do do contract development and manufacturing, and we use definitely use screen printing a lot, you know, we're not going to tell you guys, you know, that it, it always wins. And um, that's why we now have a seamstress within the company to help us do um, embroidery using conductive yarns and making biosensors into, into materials uh, doing that. And I'm almost in my last section now because I want to do an on-read discussion about, you know, wearable biosensors, um, a big health advantage or use of wearable biosensors would be wound care. And, wound, and smart bandages, I think this term smart bandages must have been around for at least 15 years. Um, you know, and, you know, it's a big problem that, you know, people have chronic wounds, especially in the diabetes space. They have ulcers on their feet and et cetera, and it can, it can lead to um, limb loss. And when you read the academic literature, there's plenty of people working on smart bandages and exactly on the kind of thing I'm talking about where, you know, people with... Um, diabetes can end up with ulcers and these things don't heal up very well and in fact you know measuring the, the health of a wound is fairly straightforward from a biosensor perspective if you have bacteria in a wound then it can raise the uric acid content and i mean on the zimmer and got web store we have a uric acid sensor so i know uric acid um, is quite measurable and you can also i mean skin has a healthy ph which is kind of four to five and if the skin is not in a good shape or the wound is not in a good shape, then the pH is not at um, pH 4 to 5. So pH is also quite doable. So smart bandages and measuring the health under all the dressing in the wound is quite doable. And the big question is, is um, 
if it's also doable, um, why are there no smart bandages on the market? And this was one of my, I asked the sort of three questions, you know, what are we gonna measure? Where are we gonna measure it? And why are we going to measure it? And this, this really comes back to, comes down to a really cynical point that I think smart bandages would really help the patient. But why are there no smart bandages on the market? And I think it's because uh, at the moment, the current workflow is this. Um, somebody has a chronic wound, they go to the hospital or clinic, the wound is changed, the old wound dressing is thrown away, they come back some days or weeks later, the wound dressing is changed. So wherever the, whether the wound is infected or not, the wound dressing is changed. That's a really good revenue model for people who make wound dressings because the wound, is, the wound dressing is getting replaced, whatever, um, whether there's an infection or it needs to happen, whatever. So you don't really want to disrupt that, um, that business model. So in, it, the incumbent people working in wound care, the workflow works, there's people trained to do this kind of um, wound care, and the manufacturers of these types of products, you know, they don't necessarily want to stop the model where bandages are put onto the skin or onto the wounds and then they're purely replaced, because why would you want to disrupt that business model? So. Um, even though wound care would help the patient, the patient is not the final payer. Um, um, so the final payer is often actually the healthcare system or the healthcare insurer. Yeah, so Matthew Reback is asking a question. I'm curious about biofouling of electrodes. Yeah, well, so biofouling of electrodes is a big problem in continuous glucose monitoring, for example. Um, I think Medtronic might have some patents out where they're using impedance spectroscopy um, or parts of impedance spectroscopy to measure biofouling. So I think um, I might have actually run out of, um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, there are ways of measuring biofouling. Um, biofouling could could be potentially read through something like impedance spectroscopy, and I think Medtronic have got might have some patents out there around that. So, yeah, biofouling is a problem. So, my final point on on um, on bandages, smart bandages, is it's a long time coming, and I think it's because the market um, doesn't want to change, and it's it's only it's only somebody coming in with a new company who's going to force this kind of change to, to um, take place. And if somebody does come up with a smart bandage, what's going to happen is this. They will get onto the market, but there'll be a gap then in sales. And so if you ever do manage to get a product in wearables onto the market, it's worth reading a book um, by a guy called uh, Jeffrey Moore called Crossing the Chasm. Because even if you have a great product, there might be a gap in its sales cycle. And it's definitely worth reading a book by um, a guy called Jeffrey Moore. So I'm going to come to the end now. Um, I appreciate that some people have a hard stop on the hour. Uh, I had a few notes through to sort of say, yeah, please, you know, it's very interesting, but I need you to finish on the hour. So I'll do that. So wearables are already here. CGM is, is leading this. Um, to Matthew Reback's point, actually, um, biofouling is a big problem on, um, for example, CGM sensors. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a problem worth looking at. I think hydration is coming. It's quite doable. Measuring people's hydration in the sweat for athletes really is quite doable. And I'm not quite sure why those products are not coming out. Um, but even great ideas struggle to get to market. Um, wearable bandages, or smart bandages rather, have been a long time coming, but yet they're still not on the market. Um, and I, to, in the world of biosensors, before COVID-19, wearables was the exciting growth or the exciting R&D in, um, in biosensing. Now that's been eclipsed at the moment by COVID-19. Um, and I'm happy that we've actually got a COVID-19 sensor under development. It looks to be working really well. So um, I appreciate it very much. This video will be up on YouTube um, in a few hours. So if you want to go back through it, um, you can do that. So. I will end this morning. I do appreciate the questions that came through on YouTube. And um, any questions, just contact us either through the YouTube, YouTube channel or through LinkedIn or um, under the contact us at Zimmer and Peacock. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate it, guys.